So in part three, we're going to talk about significance. Now, the first way I want to approach significance is by using uh, a fairly well-known model, Partington. And he reflected on what we mean when we talk about historical significance. What is it that makes something significant? And Partington's answer was that it generally fulfills one or more of these criteria. So when we talk about something being significant, it's either because it has importance and that might be to the people in the past. So it was seen in that period of time as being important. It has a, a sense of profundity, that people's lives have been affected deeply. So profundity, just profoundness, a profound impact on people. Quantity, that the event we're talking about had an impact on many people's lives. Durability, for how long have people's lives been affected, or relevance in terms of um, how it helps us understand our current life or, or even that it has helped to shape our current life in significant ways. So if we're unpicking the concept of significance and we want children to talk about what were more or less significant events in the history classroom, then it's useful to give them this framework so they can start to unpick what would constitute significance and just as importantly really, how would they go about justifying the decision they were making about something significant. The Christine Council has come up with a, a different way of, of um, categorising significance and, and she uses the five R's. So the first is remarkable. It was remarked upon by people at the time or since. So it's something that people have recognised as being important. It's remembered that it was important at some stage in history within the collective memory of a group or groups of people. That it resulted in change, that it had consequences for the future, that it was resonant. People like to make analogies with it, that it's possible to connect with experiences, beliefs or situations across time and space, or that it was revealing, and we might say something was significant because it reveals some important aspect of the past. So again, similar to Partington, the purpose of these is to use them in the classroom, really, to help children unpick what a big abstract concept like significance would be. So in Rob Phillips' book, um, on becoming a reflective teacher of history, he illustrates this with, a, with an example of uh, an inquiry question for World War I, which is using the notion of significance. So the question he comes up with overall was, why was World War I called the Great War? And it's that word great which is significant. So what was great about it? Why was it great? Why was it seen as more significant than other wars? And if he's using the Partington criteria, and he came up with five mini questions, five uh, additional questions to ask. When you add them up, you could come back to that big question and answer, why was it called the Great War? So if we're considering importance, we could ask the children who was affected by the war. And he suggests that in order to answer that question, we study the main events. We get some sense of the scope of the war. Profundity. How were people's lives changed? And he says here in the history class, and we might get a collection of contemporary accounts from different people involved with the war and impacted by the war in different ways and start to look at those letters, postcards, home, diaries, um, plays and stories that were constructed at the time to get some sense of how profound the changes were. How many were affected? Well, we might analyse the Western Front and the Home Front just to get some sense of how many people's lives were touched by this. Durability. We might ask a slightly different historical question here. Why is it important to continue to remember the war? And there we might switch focus and look at modern accounts around commemoration and remembrance and look at arguments people make to continue to study and remember the war. And then finally, relevance. We might ask ourselves, why from the standpoint of today as a child is it important to continue to study the First World War? And that would lead us into considering long-term effects. And when you've answered all of those questions, you could come back and give a, a sensible answer to the question, why was World War I called the Great War? So there's a really nice applied model by Phillips of how we would use some of these structures to actually construct a, a, a reasonable and interesting and engaging and historically meaningful scheme of work over time. It's also nice because it illustrates something we'll come to later in the course. When planning, this notion of um, inquiry questions, big questions like this first one, which are linked to substantive concepts like significance, and then smaller questions, which when you add up the answer to the smaller questions, you can get back to that big question 
important inquiry questions. That's a really useful model to use as a teacher, both because it is useful for you to think about how to sequence these things and how to give children the information to come back and answer big significant questions, but secondly because the questions themselves are helpful to keep the students focused and on task and to help them sharpen up their thinking with regard to the content. So how might we go about teaching significance? Here are some suggestions. We can ask children to assess the impact of individuals, individually and comparatively. So we can look at case studies of, of great, significant, important people, and we can compare people within periods of time and across periods of time, and, and then use that to assess their significance. Uh, a typical example in lots of classrooms here in the UK would be to look at um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X as two significant members um, of the civil rights movement and think about the different strategies they use and think about their significance in, in moving America towards um, a greater recognition of the, importantness, the importance of equality. So we might also consider whether people make good role models and ask children to pick role models and, and explain why they think they're good and what, um, in what ways are they good. So we're beginning to really kind of apply criteria to this judgment of significance. We might think about how our lives are affected by events. Um, we might think about how one period leads to others and subsequent changes. So a, a period significance might not be in and of itself, but because of um, the fact that it opens the door to uh, more advanced thinking. Um, we might hand out cards with events for a period and ask children to choose the most significant and just use that as a way to encourage them to make decisions and to justify their decisions. Uh, or we might hand out cards with reasons for studying this period of time and ask students to discuss the most important of them so the teacher could prepare uh, uh, 10 reasons why I think it's important that you study X, Y and Z and then the students list them and put them in order and, and at least uh, it generates a conversation about the meaningfulness of the topic and it gets the children <clears throat> to think about why the study of this topic is important. So this is a way to kind of try and help bring the concept of significance home to the children rather than just as an abstract thing to do. So it's important, I think, when approaching significance in the classroom, that we need to think about focusing on the judgment. So set children up. To, to explain, I think X is important because, or I think the long-term significance of Y was, and, and get them to give you explanations. It's not just the judgment you want to hear, in fact, that's less important. It's the, the reasoning behind it that's important. For that reason, the second way to approach significance that seems to me quite useful is, is through debate and discussion. They're helpful because they enable students to hear other arguments and to weigh up competing perspectives because people will have different reasons for ascribing significance. But they also reinforce the idea that significance is a judgment to be ascribed to something, not a quality residing within it. So there really is no right answer as to which was more significant out of a selection of events. It's there to be argued over and if you can give a good strong rationale for it, then it might make sense, even though you might be in the minority. And that is, seems to me, inherent in the nature of significance. And we also need to remember that ascribing significance requires a shift from concrete to more abstract thinking, from specific to um, details about events to generalisations. And so we need to give children time to think that through and to reason it. And using debates and discussions and paired discussion especially is a really useful um, opportunity to give children space to rehearse that, to verbalise their thinking, to develop and refine their thinking, to put it open to questioning so that they can sharpen up their um, the justifications they give. <clears throat> Sir Cadillo who was a, a PhD student with the Project Chatter team, um, undertook her research in this as a second order concept. So she was trying to describe how children make progress over time in their use of the concept of significance. And so she says that people start off uh, not really making any kind of judgment about significance. Then they develop this simple notion that um, significance is intrinsic so the event is significant you can spot significance because the event is significant everyone would agree on what was significant in the same way that you might say uh, the second world war lasted for six years you might also say it was significant that it's just a characteristic of the event 
then um, children move on to have some kind of uh, sense that significance is, is rooted in the context that it's still fixed. And then finally, as they become a bit more developed, then they understand that it is rooted in context and that it's variable. So different perceptions um, from different groups might ascribe significance differently. If you ask yourself a different question, um, then from our standpoint, a different kind of historical inquiry question, then different factors might emerge as significant. So you start to understand that variability and uh, um, that conditionality really to the context in which you're asking yourself a question of something significant. So at the highest level, Circadio argued students have a sense that significance depends on the context in which events happened and in which the historical question is being asked and the nature and purpose of the inquiry in which significance features. So I'm going to end by saying something about why I think this is important. On the one hand, significance is difficult because it can merge a little bit into the more easily grasped idea of consequence. But it seems to me uh, that it's worth pursuing the idea of significance in the classroom for these three reasons. It requires students to use their historical knowledge and this, thus they're consolidating prior learning. So really, significance, like causation, is a, is a conversation you can only have when you know something about the period. And so by having a conversation about causation and about significance, we're giving children opportunities to reuse and rehearse and refine their prior learning so that they can consolidate their understanding and they can use it to move themselves up in terms of um, conceptual thinking. So it's, secondly, it's important because it requires students to engage in more conceptual argument and therefore helps them to think at a higher level of criticality. And thirdly, I just think it's very useful in the classroom because it reinforces the value and relevance of the study of history. So here are some additional references uh, for the issues we've talked about in relation to significance. Um, again, this has been fairly speedy run through and there are some quite kind of intense models of progression going on here and indeed in the reading that we'll come to in the next uh, short lecture. I think the main thing here is it's useful is just to flag up that these are important concepts that when we talk about history, we can talk about the, the facts and the uh, events and the people that populated um, history. But we have to do something with the past to make it history. And largely, what I'm trying to um, communicate to you is that we do that by drawing on the, a slightly more abstract set of concepts, what is often called in the literature second order concepts. So chronology, causation, consequence change, significance are second order concepts. They are the, the things that historians work with to make sense of the past and to turn it into historical accounts. And so it's really important that we start to become familiar with using this language and hopefully that you can start to see how these models of progression um, hold together and start hopefully also to relate this to your teaching practice to start to think about well yeah that's interesting how do children's views of history change from the very first year when you encounter them in school to the very last year just before they do their exams and, and leave and, and move on to higher education or into the workplace so by asking ourselves constantly, what is it that constitutes progression in terms of the quality of historical thinking, then we can get to a shared language. It doesn't really matter that you're teaching about um, a local history in your part of the world and I'm teaching about a local history in my part of the world. What unites us is that we are encouraging children to think in more sophisticated historical ways about the events that they're encountering. And that's a shared academic language and a shared sense of the world. Um, clearly the stories, the people, the events will all be different, but causation, continuity, uh, significance are all going to be a part of making sense of that story in an historically appropriate way.